Welcome back to This Week. Time now to get the views of our media and political experts, MMA Creative Vice President and Democratic Operative Mike Kopp, and her daily on 1510 WLAC syndicated talk show host, Steve Gill. Welcome. Nice to see you both again. Let's talk a little bit about the Rand Paul incident. Does this kind of kind of highlight maybe a need for a review of what happens with TSA screening? I mean, he was stopped. He went through the process. They didn't find anything, and yet he was not allowed to go through the process again unless he was going to go through a full body pat down, which he did not want to do. Yeah, I think part of the problem with this whole system is that I think as you look at the results, a lot of people are pretty convinced this is about pretending to make us safe rather than actually screening. I think this is a prime example of it. There was clearly nothing being hidden in him mid-calf, mm-hmm. uh, and not letting him go back through the screening system again rather than subjecting him to this is the kind of mistreatment that passengers are facing. The problem they made is picking on a U.S. senator, yeah. and he's in position to do something about it. Yeah, I, I think what they need more than anything else is common sense training. I mean, you look at situations like this. I mean, uh, allowing the guy to go back through would not be a big deal. It seems unless common. there were a lot of people in line, but there's no indication that there was a, a, a rush of people trying to get through the, the, you know, the detectors at that particular moment. So I think it gets back to just using some common sense. Marsha Blackburn is one of the sponsors of what they call it the strip law to kind of reevaluate the process. Do we, are we at that point in you know, 11 years after these were implemented because of 9-11 to kind of relook and see what works and what doesn't work? Look, when they are groping grannies, when they're <laughs> digging around in the diapers of, you know, yeah. eight-month-old babies, there yeah. is something bad wrong with the system. And they're sure not catching a lot of bad guys. Uh, they ought to be focusing on making us safe. And when you think about it, on the other end of the screening system, you've got all these food service workers that have knives on the other side <laughs> of the screening system. So how much is this about security or about pretend? I think because this touches the lives of so many millions of Americans. Americans every year, it's got to be looked at on a regular basis. Well, anybody who goes to the airport has been through it, and even if you've gone through and never been detained, it takes time, it takes effort, it slows the process down. Everybody wants to be safe, but I guess the, the question is, can it be streamlined and made more effective? And I think the key it, 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 with um, Blackburn's idea is that whatever kind of review of the process mm-hmm. they do, again, factor in some common sense training. I think you can think also about how the terrorists constantly refine and, and redefine their, their attacks, they're going to go after soft targets. If we have hardened the airports, which is a good thing, right. there are going to be more spectacular attacks. There are going to be things they can do with all the other soft targets in our communities that are not even screened at all. And I think that's where we got to be looking ahead. Not what have they done, but what they may do next. Well, in the whole world of cyber attacks, I mean, that, that, right. that's where it's going to come. And I, and I think we're taking steps in that direction. But, again, I agree with you on, on that. Here in Tennessee, the governor is behind a proposal to Add a change of constitution, add an amendment to the constitution, which is really kind of bizarre because it would do, it changed the constitution from the way it exists to what's happening now, even though it's not following the constitution. I guess the question is, are we getting too many constitutional amendments? We want two or three issues now with an income tax, abortion issue now, that now the way judges are appointed. Do we need to look at what the Constitution says and kind of move in that direction or change what everybody is wanting to do in regards to how it's done now? I have a serious problem with this issue because you've got the Constitution that, as the lieutenant governor said, is crystal clear. We should be electing the judges. By votes. So they have just ignored the law for a period of time because the judges kind of like the system where they don't have to face the voters. Uh, there's an old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I got an idea. If it's broke, let's <laughs> fix it before we keep breaking the law. I think, like anything else, it's good to, to do a review of things like that. I would agree. I think it, 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 there is a, something about it just doesn't make a lot of sense. But I understand the argument, though, about uh, you know not being clear on the you know allowing people to politicize these judicial appointments and these. Uh, it's a these bizarre things. argument. We're doing it illegally. Let's make how we're doing it illegally right. legal. Right. And exactly. let's let the people vote, right. even though we're saying the people shouldn't be able to vote mm-hmm. on Supreme Court justices. We're still going to vote on our local judges. If we're worried about the corruption in the system, then why are we letting us elect judges locally when we're saying the Supreme Court shouldn't <laughs> be elected? And why are we electing state representatives and state senators and governors? Then fine, let's just let them go in the back room and pick it. The people ought to have the say. And I think you're going to see the Tea Party get very involved in this issue. Well, and, and just looking at the pure politics of it, I don't know how you win that amendment on a ballot. Yeah. You really don't. The judges are for it because they wouldn't have to face the people on a vote other than a retention vote. And again, I understand the logic of let, let's do everything we can to, to keep politics out of the bench, but to everyone's point, I would agree on that. 
little bit of a surprise, maybe. Bill Ketron decides, State Senator Bill Ketron decides not to make a run for the 4th District. Sounded like for quite a while this was going to be a, a challenged primary in the GOP for that 4th District. Desjardins, Scott Desjardins, a freshman who won in a heated battle down there two years ago. Now it looks like uh, no challenge. The geographics make it look like a good one for Bill Ketron or somebody from Rutherford County to run because you've got about 80% of the 4th District is now new. Rutherford County is the biggest bulk mm-hmm. population in that district. So you would think somebody runs from Rutherford County, people in Rutherford County vote for their guy, they win the Republican primary. But you still have a brutal primary to look at. You still have the geography to beat in, in all these counties that are included. And at the bottom of the line, any conservative that's going to run has to explain why they should replace Scott Desjardins. And there aren't a lot of votes that they can say he did wrong. So you're back to the basics of, I'm running because he's got it and I want it, and I'm not sure political ambition is going to play well with the voters. I think it's always hard to beat an incumbent, especially one that doesn't have a long record. He's also raised a lot of money. A lot of money came through from PACs and right. DC toward the end of the year. The other issue, though, is that district was was redrawn, many believe, to help Ketron. Mm-hmm. And then after it's redrawn, Ketron decides not to run. I wonder if that was a surprise to the people who drew the district. And party leaders would never say this, but they do not like their own person who holds that 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 uh, seat being challenged by someone from their own party. I think that's I think that's exactly right. Well, and you're going to spend a lot of money in that primary battle that's already in your hands. Let's look around the country if you're going to allocate your money. Let's look at seats that you try to take from the other side rather than have a bitter bloodbath on one you've already got. Talk the GOP primary nationally it looked like a free for all after New Gingrich wins South Carolina. It's anybody's race. Uh, Mitt Romney comes out in the Florida debates. Obviously, he's got a new debate coach. He's got fired. He's hadn't had it since the election started. Again, is Florida going to be the key, or is this going to drag on a little bit, a little bit past Florida, regardless of who wins there? It'll drag on in part because February is going to be a relatively slow mm-hmm. month. We've had this just week after week after week debates and, and elections. Now we kind of move into a slower pace in February, but heading to March 6th and Super Tuesday, we've got nine states. So everybody's going to try to retrench, get money, and be ready to hit this nine-state uh, onslaught. I think that if Romney wins Saturday um, or, or wins Tuesday, the next month is going to be be difficult for the other guys to raise the money raise the profile and compete. Uh, if he wins in, in Florida, it's not over, but it certainly puts him back in as uh, probably inevitable. I would agree to a point. I think the margin is going to be the factor. I think what we saw in the other races, Ronnie keeps, keeps hitting this glass ceiling, yeah. and he's not winning the majority of the Republican vote. And, 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 if, and if he can't pull a majority out of Florida, I don't see where it, you know, he still has to deal with that issue across the board. Oh, right. Nevada, you got Michigan that, again, are not going to be good ground for him. Better ground for Romney in this right. month of February. Are we ready to say it's a two-person race, Santorum and Paul? Are they basically done? Well, Santorum has, has left Florida because he doesn't have the money, right. doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the organization, not even going to compete. Ron Paul is not putting anything on TV, has no organization, isn't campaigning in the state. They're go- both going to finish probably in single digits, which, again, is kind of hard to see how they rebound before Super Tuesday, both in terms of fundraising and visibility. Uh, it's clearly a two-person race. Does Gingrich have a little bit of hope, even if he doesn't win Florida, in that Super Tuesday? You've got states like Tennessee where he'll probably play a little bit better. Still got some hope out there. And he's the last conservative alternative right. to Romney standing. So I think that's what he's been wanting all along. The, the question is whether or not in this volatile season where we've seen ups and downs like crazy, whether or not there are more surprises, twists and turns, and roller coaster moves ahead. I guarantee you there are. The president delivers his State of the Union, and he kind of goes and kind of takes it to the Republicans and says, this is what's going to be the election year stance. Tax the rich. Everybody should pay their fair share, which means people who make a lot of money should probably be paying more if the president gets his way. It's kind of interesting that he's making the fair share argument. We've got half the people in this country who pay zero federal income taxes, and he's been trotting out this same, you know, tax the rich, let's punish the successful. He's tried it for three years. It didn't work, and I don't think it's going to work any better now. I think the argument bringing in the Warren Buffett factor, Mm -hmm. it actually does resonate with people, and I think because of the whole Occupy movement, we have people out there that that do believe there's not fairness in, in our economic situation. So I think he's playing right to the electric, and I think it's a smart move. Do you think it's resonating at all? Polls seem to indicate people are agreeing to some extent that maybe people who make several million dollars, million dollars or more, should be looked at to make sure they're paying at least what everybody else pays percentage-wise. I think it's the worst kind of politics, basically, to play this kind of divide us, the, the, the envy game, particularly when I think people ultimately are going to come down to the fact, I'm not as worried about what you're making as the fact that millions of Americans are making nothing because we have nearly a double unemployment rate over where we were. I think that's why it resonates. So many people are out of work and they're looking for a job, and when they see people making all this kind of money and not paying what they think is a fair share of taxes, of course it's going to Mike work. Mike Cop, Steve Gill, appreciate your time and your insights. Stay with us. This week continues in a moment.